<laughs> just wanted to see how that would feel for a second. About like I thought it would. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad that you're with us. Um, happy Sunday, almost Christmas. It's two weeks away, but we're almost there. Um, we're glad that you're with us. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Matt McDonald. I'm the lead pastor here at Common Ground Church. We're glad that you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. Um, <clears throat> We are a church, one of the things we believe defines or at least speaks into our culture uh, is that we are a church that you are welcome while you're working on it. Um, we don't believe that you have to have it all put together in order to come in here, rather that this is a place where you can hopefully be helped put some things together, uh, but not be perfect when you walk in. Because um, if you're perfect when you walk in, you'll kind of mess up the vibe we have going on, so... <laughs> Like, don't do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do just want to take a quick second and say thank you to all of our incredible servant leaders, everybody, everybody that serves in different areas on Sunday morning. <laughs> Appreciate you guys so much. Um, we had our serve team Christmas brunch yesterday. Uh, super awesome time. Hopefully you felt celebrated, felt honored. But if you weren't able to make that for some reason, just want to say thank you just for serving selflessly. Uh, given of your time and being here and helping make things happen. So we appreciate you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 16 this morning. Um, and I'm going to have you in two different places. We're going to be in John 16 and James chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles, we'll have it up on the screen here in just a minute. But uh, I just wanted to give a little context for this Christmas series that we're in called Blue Christmas. Um, as we opened up last week, what this series is about is it's really a primer on mental health. Um, the goal isn't to understand the complexities of mental health perfectly, nor is it to even fix all of the problems or struggles that we're going through. It really is just to help us understand mental health a little bit better and perhaps to correct some uh, maybe misunderstandings that we have in the arena of mental health in church. And so the, the follow-up question to that has been, like, why are we doing this during Christmas? Why, why are you being such a buzzkill? and ruining Christmas and talking about something so heavy and something so tough during Christmas. Uh, well, in fact, it's because it's Christmas, uh, right? I, I don't know if you fall into the trap or, uh, or the mindset sometimes of thinking, well, it's Christmas, I have to be happy now. I have to be joyful, or I at least have to fake it real good, because otherwise I'm the Grinch, um, which I'm kind of embracing my role as a Grinch a little bit. I'm not a Grinch this year. I don't know if anybody else feels like this, but I've had this conversation a lot this week, it seems like, and people seem to be in a similar boat. Like, I don't feel like I'm the Grinch or Scrooge this year because I'm not actively trying to stop Christmas. I'm not necessarily interested in helping it along this year, though. You know what I mean? I'm just like, all right. December 26th will be here, and then... Let's get, it, let's get it out of the way so we can just move on. So I don't know if that makes me an old man or an old man mindset or what it makes me, but it's where I'm at, guys. It's a little bit of vulnerability I wanted to share with you. I'm not Grinch or Scrooge. I'm basically every dad in every Christmas movie <laughs> is what I've discovered that I am, that I used to just demonize when I was a kid. Now I'm like, I get it, bro. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> and so the, the question of why this series during Christmas, can't we just focus on the joy of the holiday, the coming, and the birth of Jesus. Um, but like, like we said last week when we started this series, we can't forget why Jesus had to come in the first place. And we can't forget who he came for, right? We're, we're at danger of turning Christmas into only celebration and forgetting that in Isaiah 61, when Jesus' life and birth is being prophesied about, it said that Jesus was coming to bring good news to the poor, to comfort those who are brokenhearted, and to be with those who mourn. Not to just bring us our dose of holiday cheer so we can get through December. He came to be with you when you're brokenhearted, to be with you when you mourn. And believe it or not, people mourn during the holidays. Sometimes Christmas is actually harder than the rest of the year because there's this added pressure of I have to be fill in the blank. And everything else seems to just pile on top of that. So to answer your question that you didn't ask, maybe you did ask, that's why we're doing this series during Christmas, because I believe it's that important for us to talk about, especially as the church. Amen? amen. Better amen? amen? All right. Last week, we talked about a bunch of different things. Um, rather than try to recap it all, because it was a lot, 
I would just encourage you to go back and watch it. It's on our YouTube channel. We talked about cool school words, cognitive distortion, dangerous assumptions, myths about mental health in the church, all that kinds of stuff. But the main thing that I will say, especially as the church, we can't be so obsessed with strictly communicating the truth of the gospel that we forget about the beauty of the gospel. Because the gospel is beautiful. It's not just stringent, hard truth, deal with it, nobody cares about how you feel. It's actually a beautiful gospel that Jesus came to show us that he did for us. So it's truth and beauty. So anyways, John chapter 16, I want to invite those of you who are able, if you would stand up uh, to your feet, just as we read uh, the scripture, just to kind of posture our hearts in a place of honor and reverence and preparedness to hear what God has for us. So John 16, verse 33, these are, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He tells them this, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. You ever feel like you're reading the Bible, you're hearing the words of Jesus, and he may just be telling, it seems like he's telling you just to make you mad or just to make you miserable. Do this, don't do this. It seems like it's, oh my gosh, I get it. Like I think of uh, a a kid hearing their parents, like, you're just telling this because you don't want me to be happy. You're just telling me this to make me miserable. Um, in reality, Jesus' word says, I've told you this so that you may have peace in me. And then he says, here on earth you will, say will, will. you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And then James 1 verses 2 and 4 says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Anybody have a favorite verse in the Bible or a favorite scripture that like, you go back to and you call it a life verse or you got a favorite verse or a favorite psalm? Yeah. Yeah. None of y'all have favorite verses? That's how we're going to do this? <laughs> I don't think we talk enough about least favorite verses. Anybody got a least favorite verse? It doesn't make you unholy. Don't, don't worry. It doesn't make it less true either. I have a least favorite verse. I think it might be this one. Because, like, you ever been going through it and someone's like, just be happy. Just find joy. I'm like, mm. So I want to read this again in the context of it being one of my least favorite verses <laughs> in the Bible. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of, of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Shut up. <laughs> right? Like... That's not what you want to hear when you're going through it. It's like, give me one of those verses that says everything's going to change and be better. Yeah. Give me this. Verse 3, he goes on, For you know that when your faith is tested, I don't want it to be, your endurance has a chance to grow. Not interested. Verse 4, So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, Half-heartedly, I'm talking about my least favorite scripture, but it doesn't change the truth and the value that is placed in our ability to develop endurance when we're going through stuff. The Bible places such a high value on endurance that it speaks to it by saying, when it's, per when it's fully developed, you will be perfect and complete. That's how valuable and important endurance is according to the Bible. Now, we know that on this side of heaven, We'll never be perfect and complete, but we are growing and being developed in that. And the value that the Bible places on endurance is incredible. So at the very least, I may not like it initially. At the very least, I can take a second look at the trials and the problems and the struggles I am going through. But here's the thing. We don't have to endure in, in terms of just sitting here and letting life happen to us until heaven comes. Yeah. That's not what endurance is. It's about developing the skills along with the truth of the word of God because that's where the skills come from yeah. to continue to move forward and develop that endurance this side of heaven. Mm -hmm. And so if you're taking notes this morning, the message title is called The Coping Continuum. We're going to talk about ways to cope with struggles today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the promises, the truth, and the beauty that is in your word. Lord, I pray that um, this morning, individually, Lord, that you would speak to us in a way that we can hear and understand where it is you're leading us in terms of developing endurance for anything we might be going through. 
Lord, I pray you ready our minds, our hearts to hear the beauty in your word. And Lord, I pray you would anoint my mind, my lips to speak your truth in love. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Can we give God a praise this morning? Come on. You guys, you guys here last week when we did the wave? All right, now go ahead, have a seat. Some of y'all were like, I ain't even waiting. I'm sitting down now. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, I have a question. Feel free to answer out loud or not. Um, so if you drive, I have a question. If you drive a car. When your car is running low on what it needs to run, and you go to one of these stations to fill up your car with what it needs to run. How do you phrase that? Like, I'm going to what? Get gas? Petrol station. That's what I'm talking about. That's a Harry Potter fan right there I've ever heard. It sounds like a... <laughs> get gas. Okay, get gas any other ways? Anyway? Fill up? You want to fill up? What? Go, on, go to what? Put gas. There we go. That's my favorite New Mexicanism ever. So I'm going to go put gas. Like, where are you putting it? Like, in the car? Actually, my favorite is when it's combined with my other favorite one. If you're from New Mexico, or maybe it's a more of a northern New Mexico thing, but it's definitely, I hear it in Albuquerque all the time, is I have to get down from my car and go put gas. Anybody here? Yeah? Do you guys live here? Like, you? Like, yeah. <laughs> That's my I love, I love cultural, regional quirks and sayings and all that kinds of stuff. Um, let me ask you another question, a follow-up question, while we're on the subject of petroleum nitrate. Do you have a strategy for filling up your car with gas? What I mean by that is, do you do it like once a week, no matter where your gas gauge is at, you're just going to go get gas this day? Um, anybody do that? Anybody? This is pretty smart. This is pretty smart. Pretty smart. Do anybody have like, it's not going to get below quarter tank, quarter tank folk. My parents were quarter tank folk. They raised me to be a quarter tank folk. So inevitably, I did not become one. Um, anybody... Gaslight on, people? That's it. There we go. These are my people. <laughs> now, I have a problem when it comes to getting gas in my car. Um, I don't just wait for the light to come on. I like to live dangerously. <laughs> I wait for it to come on, and then I'm like, let's see how far we can push this bad boy. Now, when I was 19 or 20, I had a truck, a small truck. Uh, the gas gauge didn't work only the gas light. So I only ever knew that I needed gas when the gas light would come on. And so even then, I'm like, I should probably know how far I can stretch this if I ever find myself in a pickle. Or if the gas lights, I, I don't know, I just told myself I needed to know. So I, and so from the time the gas light came on to the time I could no longer move that truck was 45 miles. And so I've always heard the old, like, oh, once a gas light come on, you have a good 30, 50 miles, something like that. So now in newer cars, it tells you. Like the gas light comes on, you can navigate through, and it says 50 miles till empty. 50. So I don't even, Jason, I don't even wait for that anymore. I wait until the gas light comes on, until it stops giving you a number, and all it says is fuel low. <laughs> and even then, I'm like, let's keep doing this thing. <laughs> Let's keep doing this dance and see what happened. I, I remember I was on a trip to Midland, Texas a long time ago, and I was driving, and I stopped at a town, I don't remember what town, to get some lunch. And the, the rental car that I had was at half a tank. One, you know your own car usually. You don't really know a rental car. So I stopped to get food. I had about a half a tank. I'm like, I can make it. I don't need to fill up yet. Let me just get some food, get some on the road. If you've ever driven through West Texas, never believe that lie, that there's a gas station around the corner. There is nothing around the corner. And then once you get there, there's more nothing, and it's all flat and a whole bunch of nothing. And so here I am, like barely on fumes, rolling into this town because not only had the gas light come on, not only had the numbers stopped going, it didn't even say low fuel anymore, it just had a bunch of dashes. <laughs> and I'm like, there has got to be a gas station, Lord, save me. And you know, like when you become real faith-filled and real spiritual due to your lack of preparation and common sense... <laughs> Lord, give me the answers to this test that I didn't even know was happening till this moment. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. <laughs> it saved me from this car. So I, by the, by the hair on my chinny, chin, chin, barely skated into this gas station and filled up and didn't get stranded on the side of the road. Praise Jesus. 
But I really think that was the worst thing that could have happened to me. I think I needed to get stranded to learn my lesson. Because you know what I didn't do? I did not learn my lesson that day. If anything, my, <laughs> this, this, this complex that had developed in me only heightened. Because I'm like, I can do anything. I am never going to run out of gas again a day in my life. The best route in terms of filling up our car with gas would probably be to have a plan on when to fill it up, whether it's once a week, quarter tank, light comes on, anything like that, rather than risk waiting until the very end because a couple of things could happen. One, you could damage the car by trying to run it on empty. Two, you could find yourself in a pretty sticky situation if you break down in the middle of nowhere and you don't know where the next gas station is. And I really believe that something can be said very similarly as it relates to our mental health. The, the healthiest route forward would probably be to have routine fill-ups, routine maintenance, routine checkups, not simply wait until something in us has run out or is on empty before we even start thinking about doing something about it. Regular ways to deal with the things, right? Jesus promised we will have trouble. He didn't promise, he's like, I promise I'm going to make trouble for you. He just said, hey, heads up, on the road, it's like a good person. If you're hiking up a mountain, people coming down should tell you what's ahead. Like, there's going to be trouble up there. So we need regular ways to deal with things so that they hopefully don't undo us when they happen. We would call those coping skills. And as we learned last week, the Bible actually has a lot more to say about mental health than we realize. But coping skills are important, so I want to define it for us. Here's what coping skills are. It's a conscious strategy used to reduce unpleasant emotions. Anybody have an unpleasant emotion ever? Got some right now. Got some right now. It's like, can you hurry up? It's almost noon. I'm hungry. Got a game on that I'd like to watch? You're not as funny as you think you are? Can we just... (laughs) We all know that's a lie. (laughs) Um... Like these, these negative emotions and, and unpleasant emotions that we have, coping skills are simply a conscious strategy to reduce those. Coping strategies can be cognitions. Cognitions are simply their thought patterns or perceptions would be a good word uh, to describe it as well. Or behaviors, and they can be individual or social. So there are these perceptions that we have individually in our life when we're by ourselves or when we're together with other people, and they're used to overcome struggles or difficulties in life and are a means for maintaining a person's mental well-being. I don't know about you, but I would like to have a good way to deal with and reduce the negative emotions I feel. I like the good ones. I'd like a way, though, to deal with the bad ones because I also live in reality And we're not only going to experience pleasant emotions. We're going to experience some unpleasant ones, especially if you drive on I-25 at the wrong time of day. And here's the thing. Everybody copes. Everybody copes. I used to think um, coping was a bad thing. I I used to think that if you were having to cope with something, that means you didn't have enough faith that God would deal with something. When in reality, coping isn't good or bad. It's just a thing. There are unhealthy ways to cope, and there are healthy ways to cope. So coping isn't the issue. It's how we cope with things. And mental and emotional health issues, they happen when our coping skills, our way of dealing with things, get overwhelmed. Anybody ever been overwhelmed after a long day, week, month, year, life? (laughs) And and things start to overwhelm us, and and our normal coping skills are no longer adequate to deal with the situation at hand. That's when mental health issues and struggles really become prominent in our lives. So one of the questions I think we need to ask is, when do our coping skills get overwhelmed? Like, what what happens in order to overwhelm us? And while it's a pretty complex subject we can get into, I do want to talk about two that I think will help at least... Help us frame life. So two primary ways our coping skills get overwhelmed. One is this. When you have a normal response to an abnormal life event. Right? A normal response to an abnormal life event. What does that mean? Well, this, this happened a lot during the COVID pandemic. That was an abnormal life event. And the reason I'm talking about that one is because that's something we all went through. Like, that wasn't, well, I went through this, you can't understand what, like, everybody went 
through the COVID pandemic. And there was a normal response to that in, in large part because n- none of us knew what was happening. We didn't know how to deal with it. We didn't remember when, like, you couldn't make eye contact. I think it's, I've, I've read it's transmitted through 10 seconds of eye contact, so don't look at me. Or like when we would spray down our groceries on the front porch. We, none of us knew what to do or how to, so we were all doing the best we could to try to figure out how to navigate through this abnormal life event. And so as, as silly as some of this stuff seems now looking back then, it was, it was a pretty normal response to an abnormal life event because we didn't know what to expect that we bought up all the toilet paper. <laughs> and they were like, what are we going to do? We don't have toilet paper. I'm like, I don't know. There's a shower, pine cones I've heard from camping. I don't know what you do. I don't know how to do that. I read about it in a book. But that was a a normal response to an abnormal life event. And we saw a lot of coping skills that were, at the very least, exasperated during the COVID pandemic, three of which we'll talk about briefly. I would say eating, exercise, and alcohol. Those three things we saw. Because eating can be a coping mechanism. Not always an unhealthy one, but I think we can all agree it can become unhealthy really quickly. But I don't know about you, it can be, like sometimes during this time of year, there's nothing that a Little Debbie Christmas tree snack cake cannot fix in my life. (laughs) Or a dark chocolate cordial cherry. I had two of them between service. (laughs) And I am on cloud nine right now. But during COVID... What became unhealthy was that vegan edible cookie dough that Costco sells by the tub that I didn't even bother to put the spoon away anymore. I just left it in the tub because I knew I'd be back. <laughs> I knew I'd be back real, real quick. <laughs> that quickly became unhealthy because it got exasperated by this abnormal event. Exercise was the same way. Now, I'll wait to gauge the room until after I say this, but you can exercise too much. Okay, let's test on the waters there. <laughs> the people that exercise are like, no, you can't, loser. <laughs> the people that don't exercise are like, amen. <laughs> so much so, I'm not even going to do it at all. <laughs> it can become excessive, even alcohol consumption. Right now, I am not recommending alcohol as a way to cope. But hear me, I am also not demonizing alcohol. But it can become unhealthy really quickly especially if that's your means to cope. It's a normal response to an abnormal life event is one of the way our coping skills get over- overwhelmed. Another way is the reverse of that, an abnormal response to a normal life event. Maybe we would call that an overreaction, an abnormal response to a normal life event. As the prophet said, don't push me because I'm close to the edge we're trying not to lose our... Uh, uh. <laughs> the elder millennials and Gen Xers are like, yeah. <laughs> An abnormal response to a normal life event because you may just spontaneously combust on someone. You may be in line at Starbucks. <laughs> you order a large coffee and they say, oh, it's venti. Well, no, it's not. Venti is large. Grande is large. And tall is large. So congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. (laughs) And it's just like, whoa, what is wrong with (laughs) so-and-so? They are freaking out. An abnormal response to a normal life event. Why? Because you're living like me in that rent-a-car from Midland to Albuquerque. You're on the edge. You don't need much of a push. You might just turn and fall off and blow up on somebody. (laughs) And so we can't always help the circumstances, but hopefully where we can help get to by the end of today, at least to a certain extent, is a place where we can at the very least have a framework of understanding to know what to do when hard things happen. At least some semblance of a way forward instead of just sitting there and letting it happen. So that's where we get our continuum for coping, Coping continuum. It's not a phrase from Doctor Who. I know it sounds like a Doctor Who phrase, doesn't it? 
Is that the pen he has? Is there a pen or is that men in black? Men in black is like, don't remember anything. Expel the armist. <laughs> and then the TARDIS comes, right? Did I do it? Did I riz? Did I did the riz? Which, by the way, in case you weren't here last week, I think I forgot to mention this. In case you think prophetic ministry is dead in the church, it is very much alive because it was prophesied on this very stage from this very pulpit last week that riz was going to be the word of the year for 2023. And Oxford Dictionary released its word for 2023 this week, and it was riz. So you're welcome, youth pastors. Anyways, let's get serious, guys. Come on. Continuum for coping. There's, there's three stages of coping I want to talk about. Resistance, resilience, and recovery. I want to encourage you to write that down, take a picture of it. It's this coping continuum that, uh, as we talk about here in a minute, we're going to see different skills and ways forward we can do based on where we find ourselves and the challenges we find ourselves in. So let's start with resistance. Resistance is the stage where you develop the coping systems and skills that allow you to navigate life. So these are regular and consistent coping skills, um, preventative maintenance in a way. So these are, these are the, the everyday normal coping systems and skills that allow you to navigate life. Here's some examples. Like taking care of your body is an excellent example of a coping skill. Like regular rest, you have to sleep. You can't not sleep. Not sleeping is the worst. Sleeping is the best. Have you ever slept? It's good stuff. If you haven't, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Taking care of your body. Resting is important. Exercise is important. A healthy diet. All these things are important in taking care of your body and can be a way of coping with just the the normal challenges of life. Hobbies and activities that are meaningful to you are are important. Like, you can't just do one singular thing forever and ever and ever. You got to find a way to detach in a healthy way in a way that brings meaning and, and fulfillment and joy. So you got to have hobbies, meaningful activities, like pickleball. Everybody's playing pickleball now, right? You ever played pickleball? It's a blast. To my surprise, Michelle, no pickles are involved. <laughs> Not a one. I was a little disappointed and surprised. Pickleball, jiu-jitsu. If you're looking for a good gym, I know one. Um, reading, maybe you enjoy reading a lot. Maybe you enjoy woodworking, volunteering, Puzzles, coin collecting, video games, Lego, smoking meat. That one's good for everybody. Like good brisket feeds the family. But hobbies and and meaningful activities are are important to have in terms of having regular coping skills in everyday life. Um, Community and relationships are huge. Community and relationships are are, are huge. Regular fellowship. If you don't have a community, finding a community. Um, Finding your friends, like finding your friends is huge. You don't, you can be friendly with everybody, but you probably aren't going to be friends with everybody. And you don't have to be, nor should you be. But finding your friends is huge, hugely important. Cultivating your relationships is important. And then there's other, like um, for in the church, those people who we follow Jesus with our lives, there's reading scripture, meditating on scripture, practicing grace, practicing forgiveness, All these are examples of consistent coping skills and just uh, practices that help you be resistant to being overwhelmed by the challenges in life that happen. But here's the thing. Even if you have good coping skills, it does not prevent things from happening that are outside of your control that can lead to you becoming overwhelmed with life, right? Like you can do that every day, every day, and something outside of your control can still happen that will overwhelm your coping skills. Sometimes your resistance is simply insufficient for the current circumstance of life, and it leads to the next stage, which is resilience. Resilience is the stage where you persevere through the challenge, often with help, often with help. All the islands out there, I can do it by myself. I can't speak for women on this one because I'm not one. But I know for men, a big challenge is handle it yourself. Deal with it yourself. I think to an extent that's a, that's a human challenge. But I know for men, sometimes it's like, no, you gotta, you're an island. Be an island. You're born alone. You die alone. 
handle your business. And it's not a helpful thing. Resilience is a stage where you persevere through the challenge, often with help, and then re-engage the coping skills of resistance. This is that scripture in James that says, your endurance has a chance to grow. This is where your endurance really, really grows. But here's the thing about resilience, is it must involve recognizing what happened in order to reaccess, reapply, and re-engage the skills of resistance. Must recognize what happened. Not ignore or pretend that it didn't happen. Not deny it. Not have the Homer Homer Simpson faith. You know what I'm talking about, Homer Simpson faith, when he runs a red light? He's like, it's not illegal if I don't see it. Like, I'm pretty sure it is, still, (laughs) if you don't see it. And whether you want to recognize what happened or not, it doesn't change the fact that it happened. And if we're ever going to develop resilience and endurance, we have to recognize what happened so that we can get back to reapplying those coping skills. This is the step, however, that I believe most of us probably weren't taught very well how to do or don't even know how to do it or didn't even know that it was an option, especially with us faith-filled church folk. This is where I'm going to meddle a little bit in your life, if you'll allow me to. I really think in a well-meaning effort, I think it was implied that when challenges and struggles arise, we don't necessarily recognize them as much as we dismiss them with well-meaning, faith-filled phrases Such as, God's got this. God's got it. I don't need to worry about it because God's got it. But it's true. You don't need to worry about it, but you do got to do something about it. You you got to be the active participant in your own health as well. Not just talking about needing a bag of Oreos saying, Jesus, take away the calories. Meet me where I am. (laughs) Multiply my time even though I didn't set an alarm and I overslept by an hour. (laughs) God can, but you have to be an active participant in it. With well-meaning phrases like, God's got this. Oh, I'm leaning on him. That's great. We should be leaning on him, but you can't do nothing. Or here's my favorite one. (laughs) My favorite one is, um, oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. I mean, that one's celebrated. It's on coffee mugs. It's on shirt. It's everything. Like, it's celebrated to, no, I'm fine, everything's fine. <laughs> you, see, you ever see someone smile, but they don't with their eyes? <laughs> it's fine, I'm fine. Why, why are you so mad? I don't know what you're talking about, it's great, Nothing, nothing's wrong. And, and it's truthful, faith-filled statements like this are great as long as you're not using them to try to drown out reality, but rather work through reality. It won't help to act like it didn't happen, act like it's not happening, acting like it doesn't exist. It's fine. Everything's fine. You okay? Yep. Everything's fine. Not a care in the world. You have a lot of cares. Seems like. You have a lot of struggles. Yeah, we all do. Like, let's recognize them so that we can work through them. Trusting in and leaning on God are meant to help us overcome the struggle, not ignore it, suppress it, dismiss it, or pretend that it doesn't exist. Any optimistic people in the room? Got some optimists? Nice. Well, as a recovering optimist, I want to offer some insight on the subject of optimism and pessimism. Because I used to think that (laughs) optimism was better than pessimism. You know what I mean? Now, it is easy to think that sometimes, because sometimes pessimists are just like, dude, can you just chill? The glass is half empty. I get it, but like there's water right there. Like we can go get more water. I used to think that one was better than the other when in reality, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of seeing what's really there because as an optimist, we can't dismiss the struggle or someone else's struggle with positive sounding language just because we don't know how to deal with it or uncomfortable dealing with it or just don't want to deal with it, Right? And, and if we're more pessimistic, we, we have to lean into the fact that there is hope. I'm preaching better than you guys are hearing, apparently. It's not about being an optimist or a pessimist. It's about recognizing what's happening, knowing that my faith in God will lead me, but I've got to walk and do some work. There's this practice, this skill called mindfulness, that is really, really good for this stage of resilience. 
Um, Colossians 3.1 says it this way, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. Now, again, sometimes we're really good at reading the Bible and reading into what's not there. Versus trying to really grasp on what is there. You know what I mean? So, because I, I honestly, I used to think, and I think there's a lot of this going around probably. When it says, set your hearts, other translations say, set your minds, set your thoughts on things above. I think sometimes we make the assumption that when we do that, we don't have to worry about anything down here. We don't have to pay attention to it. We can just act like it's not there because my heart and mind is set on things above. So none of this exists. When in reality, it's not getting to the point of ignore what's here by looking up here. It's saying, knowing what's up here, keep that in mind and on your heart as you navigate through what's here. Not pretending like it's not there with positive sounding church talk. Like positive, encouraging Caleb. I'm just... Imagine you're driving, listening to Caleb, and you just have your mind set on things above. You know what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. <laughs> but it's not to ignore, it's to inform how we go through what's here by setting our hearts and minds on things above. Everybody with me? Yeah. Mindfulness is a technique that involves focusing your attention on the present moment and observing what is there without judgment. So another way of saying this would be renewing your mind, and it takes practice to renew your mind. But hear hear me on this. I might say this twice because we need to grasp it, I really believe. The more capable you become at being able to take notice of things in or around you without judging them or trying to change them, the better you'll understand the effect they can have on you and the more adept you'll be at letting problematic things go. I think we want to have an opinion too fast, I think. We want to make a judgment too quick. We see something, what do you think? I don't know, I haven't seen enough of it yet. But not us. No, we we need an opinion right away. What do you think? It's terrible. Hated it. What do you think? Loved it. Best thing ever. What do you think? Uh, It's kind of mid. We jump to it too quickly, and we think it's a good thing, but in reality, what we're doing is we're grasping a little too quickly at something, and it ends up staying longer than it should because we don't know how to let it go because we're too preoccupied with actually trying to deal with it instead of learning how to let the problematic things go. We judge things a little too quickly, especially our thoughts, before we even have a chance of letting them go. And in a well-meaning attempt to take our thoughts captive, We actually allow our thoughts to take us captive by holding on to it too long. Like sometimes you just need to let it go quickly. And and, and if you don't know how to, that's mindfulness is an excellent technique in that because it involves, okay, what's going on right now? What's going on in this moment? What is actually here versus what I feel is actually here? What is actually going on versus what do I think is actually going on? Without judgment, without trying to change it, so you can actually see what's there, so then you can know what to do and how to move forward. Because sometimes in a well-meaning effort to take our thoughts captive, we take, we take them in and we end up dwelling on them when we need to let them go, and they end up taking us captive. It's like, no, I'd rather not deal with it and learn how to let it go if it's not going to be good for me. But here's the truth. Whatever you're afraid of facing or whatever you're unwilling to face has taken you captive. We talked last week, remember, about digging deep to do the work to lay the foundation. I I think, I know I've, (laughs) I've been there and to a degree I'm there right now. I'm sometimes afraid of digging deep because I don't know what I might find. And I don't know if I want to know what's there. That's an honest place to be. But it's a dangerous one if we stay there. Because if we stay there, the thing isn't leaving. (laughs) It's still there. And so whatever we're unwilling or afraid to face 
in a sense, has taken us captive. And before we even have the chance sometimes to let these thoughts go, we start beating ourselves up for even having them. You ever think that? Like, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't think that. It's like, right, but you did think it. Let's start there. I had a therapist years ago. He told me, uh, we were talking. He kept asking me questions. And he noticed I kept using this word should. Should, should, should. You should, you should. I should, I should. And he stopped me. It was one of my favorite things he said because I thought he cussed at me at first. I was like, excuse me. He said, hey, don't should on yourself. I was like, what did you just say to me? That's a potty mouth. He said, you keep shoulding on yourself by telling yourself what you should be, what you should be saying, what should be happening. You have no actual chance of seeing what is actually there, who you actually are, what you're actually doing, because you're preoccupied with this idea of what you should be. But you'll never even get to that because, one, it's not the goal, but you'll never even have a chance to get forward or move forward if you don't start taking a look at honestly where you are and who you are and what is there. So don't should on yourself. My wife, years ago, she said this in a message, I think it was, that she preached. She said it this way, thoughts aren't facts. Thoughts are thoughts. So sometimes we condemn ourselves for having a thought when it's not a fact, it's just a thought. And then we, we heap this guilt and shame on ourselves for, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. I'm a good person. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> but thoughts aren't facts. Thoughts are thoughts. We, we, we try to change things a little too quickly. But practicing this, this technique of mindfulness, it really is a powerful skill in developing resilience and challenges. And so is therapy. However, there are some times where the challenges and struggles are significant enough that not even resistance, not even resilience are enough to get through it. And we have to move into our last stage, which is recovery. Now, recovery is the stage where professional intervention becomes critical in assisting you to re-engage the necessary life skills of resistance. Now, therapy can also be preventative maintenance, ongoing maintenance, but there are certain times where it's in this recovery stage where for whatever reason, whatever happened, life just has you so um, in this struggle that we need help moving forward. This is where coping skills are still there, therapy is a must, and potential medication. Now, I know sometimes we, in church, we're quick to demonize medication, even though that Advil you took for that sore joint probably would disagree with that. But there are times where it's necessary to help us through. But here's the thing. The goal of recovery is to not be in recovery. The goal in recovery is to get through and recover to get you back to a place where you're operating in resilience and resistance and return to a healthy mental and emotional journey that you're on. But you don't have to be ashamed of being in recovery. But you shouldn't plan on staying there forever either. So let's let's view it like this. Let's view this coping continuum, this resistance, resilience, and recovery. Let's view it in the manner of learning how to walk. Anybody ever learned how to walk? At some point, we've learned how to walk. When you learn how to walk, it takes some time, right? right? You have to, you stumble, you fall, you're wobbly, get the shaky legs, you start cruising on the furniture and everything, but eventually you learn how to walk, and eventually you master it. I feel like most of us in this room Probably pretty good walkers. I mean, I'm not the, the reigning authority voice on walking, but I think I'm pretty good. I think I'm pretty good a gold medal or two. If there was a walking contest in the Olympics. Like, sir, could you walk to that line and back? Excellent. Great job. We all learned how to walk. And most of us, we probably have mastered the ability to walk. You don't stop walking once you learn how to walk. You continue to use that skill every day to get you through your life. And then resilience would be, let's say you're out for a walk and you fall. <laughs> Falling's funny. Like there's no way that falling, every time I fall, I laugh because I'm like, I must look like a fool. But I also do the thing which you guys probably do when you fall. What's your first reaction? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. 
No one saw that. Okay. Ah. 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 That hurts. After nobody's seen, of course. But resilience would be the stage. After you fall, you scan yourself to see if you're injured, right? To, to see how, what kind of state you're in now. And then you stand up. Maybe it's a, a, a fall where you have someone with you. They need to help you up. A friend, a therapist, a teammate. They help you up. And then you, you kind of see like, okay, I, that hurt. Owie. But I can keep going. I can walk. Maybe you're hurt, but you're, you're, you're able to continue walking. That's resilience. Recovery is when you're walking after you fall. Maybe you realize you've fallen in a way that you can't get back up on your own. And in fact, you've injured yourself to the point you need to call somebody. You need someone to take you to urgent care. Maybe you need to call an ambulance in order to what? Return you to a state where you can again walk on your own. This is the coping continuum. You're walking, you master how to walk, you continue walking. Sometimes you fall. And sometimes when you fall, you're able to get back up. Sometimes when you fall, you need some help getting back up. And the discussion, at least in America, which to be fair is the only place I've ever lived, seems to only focus on resistance and recovery. Either you're fine or you're absolutely in need of immediate help. Right? It's, it's this idea that Everything traumatizes you. Everything. Now, trauma is a pretty severe deal. Being traumatized by something is a severe deal. However, not everything traumatizes somebody. Like, we can't minimize trauma because they ran out of your favorite drink at your restaurant. Or your boss called you in on your day off. Or fill in the blank... Oh my gosh, I'm traumatized. However, it's perhaps an overcorrection to previous generations' emphasis on only resistance and resilience. You've heard it, right? Oh, you fell? Rub some dirt on it. Get going. You know what I went through? You're fine. Stop crying. Get up. Keep going. And so we seemingly have two things because we have a generation right now who is growing up hearing the rub some dirt on it way of doing things, and it's just not working for them. It is not helping them. And the pendulum, the pendulum has swung way over to the other side where everything immediately and too quickly maybe is labeled trauma. And unfortunately, it has put people at odds with one another. We have one generation that's saying, keep pushing, keep going, rub some dirt on it, keep trucking, you're fine. I had to walk to school uphill both ways in a snowstorm. You're going to be okay. And then we have another generation that says, we can't. Everything is traumatizing us all the time, and we need to deal with it. And perhaps we can all agree on one thing, that life is hard. Hurt happens. We need to deal with it. It's not as black and white as we sometimes want or desire it to be. It's not always all or nothing. It's not you're perfectly healthy or you're in absolute mess and need some help. There's so much in the middle we have to take into account and honestly assess so that we don't overvalue or undervalue pain and hurt and suffering. I hurt my knee this week on Monday at jiu-jitsu. Kind of tough. <laughs> don't worry, I wasn't doing jiu-jitsu. I was just near where jiu-jitsu was happening. <laughs> when I hurt myself, Isaiah was there. Me and Isaiah were drilling. I was like, all right, I'm feeling good. I'm motivated to get back up. I stood up after drill. I'm like, all right, cool. That was not, oh. Ooh. Owie, 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 owie. Like I'm, I'm, I'm that age now where I get hurt by standing up and walking. And it hasn't been right all week. And it's been a little annoying because I was super motivated to get back into things this week. I was super motivated because I tweaked my back a few weeks ago and it kept me out for a little while. But here's the thing, like with my back, I've had plenty of back stuff in my life. I know how to navigate that now. I feel comfortable when something happens with my back. Okay, 
this is, I just need to rest it, versus, okay, this, I need a chiropractor, okay, I need to call the doctor. Like, I've had my back injury enough to where I at least am confident in the process of how to deal with that pain. My knee, however, I've never had a knee problem. And so the, the hardest thing was being unfamiliar with what to do. I didn't know whether it was a type of pain that I should push through. I didn't know whether it was a type of pain I needed to rest from. I didn't know if it was the type of pain I needed to go see a doctor about. But I, I, I know where my growing up perceptions and cognitive distortions started coming into play because my immediate thought was like, you're fine, Matt, just walk through it. And then it kept hurting the next day. I'm like, you're still fine. Quit being a wuss. Keep going. And then my, our black belt professor at jiu-jitsu said, yep, yeah, you should probably rest it. Jiu-jitsu will be here next week. You could probably rest it, ice it, and get through it. It's not everything, but it's not nothing. So I had to pause for a moment and recognize what happened, assess how I'm feeling, and then continue to walk accordingly. And when it comes to our mental health, I think we're really missing out on gaining invaluable skills and traits that get developed during resilience and critical and needed assistance that we receive during recovery when we overvalue and undervalue challenges in life. Everything is not trauma. Some things are trauma. You can't rub dirt on everything and just move forward. Some things you can walk off. All of these things are not competing thoughts and ideas, they're all true. But it takes the act of being mindful and taking a second to assess where you're at to see how you need to move forward. Again, James 1 and 2 says, when you face troubles of any kind, and kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. You know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Anybody ever been tested in anything, school, physical thing? It sure does involve a lot of work <laughs> in a test but it develops your endurance. See, we can't just focus on facts of what is happening and we can't just focus on our feelings about what is happening, but we can learn how to balance both in an effort to operate out of a renewed and a wise mind. I'll close with this. this someone gave me this model a while ago as I was uh, preparing for this and it's so, so helpful. It's this idea of a reason mind, emotion mind, and a wise mind. You see, our reason mind is this. You pay attention to the facts. Reason and logic are important. Values and feelings are not important. Facts over feelings. And I know it's probably political stuff is bubbling up to the surface right about now. But your reason mind pays attention to the facts. Reason, logic, feelings, all that, like, it's unimportant. The emotion mind is when you're emotionally focused. You are ruled by your mood, feelings, and urges. Facts, what are theirs? What are those? It doesn't matter. It's about how I feel. You, we can see how that can gets us, get us into trouble, in danger. So can this one. We can't value facts to the point where we act like our feelings aren't existing or matter. Because here's the thing, the reason mind, the reason mind people, because we all typically drift naturally towards one of these. The reason mind people look at the emotion mind people and say, whatever, get over it. Facts don't care about your feelings. Truth don't care about your feelings. And then the emotion mind says, no, whatever, I don't care about facts, they're getting in the way of my feelings. They typically look at each other and are convinced they're right and the other one's wrong. The reason mind people think that's the way to do it. The emotion mind people feel that's the way to do it. Right? There's reason minded people, emotion minded people, and somehow they end up marrying each other most of the time. <laughs> but it's not about one being the right way and one being the wrong way. It's the fact of the matter that both exist. We have a logical mind, we have an emotional mind being inside of us. It's not about one being right, one being wrong. It's about learning how to balance the two so that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The, the reason-minded people look at the feeling-minded people and be like, all right, get over it. You're feeling too much.
church. And the emotion-minded people look at the logic-minded people and be like, yeah, well, you're dead inside. (laughs) And there's this battle seemingly going back and forth. And we tend to drift towards one, but here is what the wise mind is. The wise mind, you see the value of facts and reason, and you appreciate the emotion that God has created us in, created in us. You're bringing facts and emotion into balance. And here's what I'm saying. If you're, if you're a reason-minded person, and, and that's kind of your natural drift, by tapping into and leaning into the emotion part of your mind, that doesn't change facts. It doesn't alter truth. It acknowledges that you have emotion as well that needs to be dealt with. And if you're an emotion-minded person, your feelings cannot dictate the truth, but your feelings are obviously there and need to be taken into consideration and dealt with while you move towards truth to the wise mind. And I'll close with this. There's, <laughs> I, I like basketball. Anybody? Um, I've always, I was always better in my head at basketball than I was in real life, um, but I'm really good at basketball on video games. Uh, but I like watching basketball. And um, there's always the debate in any sports, usually with anything, but in sports especially about who the greatest basketball player of all time is. I won't say anything. I don't want to be controversial. Um, But I also see these things sometimes on the internet. Uh, It's like constructing the greatest basketball player of all time if it could take different facets of different great players' game throughout history uh, and piece that together. Like if it was Steph Curry's shooting with Kyrie Irving's dribbling with Magic Johnson's passing with LeBron James' IQ with Michael Jordan's killer instinct, all these things, and you put them all together into one player, that would be the greatest basketball player of all time. And here's the thing. I think sometimes we've compartmentalized things in our life or in our mental health or in anything so much that we forget that all of these things aren't competing with each other, but they actually complement each other. And when we're willing to grow and learn how to combine and bring into balance our reason mind, our emotion mind, our coping skills, our resistance, our resilience, our recovery, and the presence of God, we may not become the greatest basketball player of all time, but we will start journeying towards the healthiest version of ourselves that we can be. And that's all we can really do is become the healthiest version of us that we can be where our endurance has a chance to grow and be fully developed. And my prayer for us this morning and through the rest of this series is that we would be willing to dig deep and acknowledge that this stuff matters and it's important for you, for your family, for your future family to become the healthiest version of yourself that you can be. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are a God who cares about our lives. Lord, this morning, you may not know all the words to say or the right things to pray, but Lord, I pray that something was awakened in us, resonated with us in a way that gives us the desire and the motivation to dig deep and do what we can do to continually be transformed by your word and renew our mind daily. God, whether we're in need of just to keep on moving forward with resistance, whether we're in a place of we need to operate in some resilience, or maybe there's some of us in here, we need recovery because stuff is just happening. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us what we need to hear in a way that we can understand it, receive it, and move forward. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.